Welcome to the first lecture in the Department of Studio Art Spring Lecture Series. I'm Gerald Auten, and I direct the Studio Art Exhibition Program. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we are gathering today and every day on Abenaki land. It's a great pleasure to introduce to you today our spring artist in residence, Diedrich Brackens. Diedrich was born in Mexia, Texas, and currently lives and works in Los Angeles, California. He received a BFA from the University of North Texas at Denton and his MFA from the California College of Fine Arts in San Francisco. And I quote from his biography at J Jack Shaneman Gallery because it's a great paragraph. Um, <clears throat> Brackens is best known for his woven tapestries that explore allegory and narrative through the artist's autobiography, broader themes of African American and queer identity, as well as American history. Brackens employs techniques from West African weaving, quilting from the American South, and European tapestry making to create both abstract and figurative works. Often depicting moments of male tenderness, Bracken's calls from African and African-American literature, poetry, and folklore as source. Beginning his process through the hand dyeing of cotton, a material he deliberately uses in acknowledgement of its brutal history, Bracken's oeuvre presents rich, nuanced visions of African-American life and identity while also alluding to the complicated histories of labor and migration. Brackens utilizes both commercial dyes and atypical pigment, pigments such as wine, tea, and bleach to create his vibrant, intricately woven tapestries that investigate historical gaps, interlacing the present with his singular magical realist worldview. His recent solo exhibition venues include the New Museum New York, Jack Shaneman Gallery New York, various small fires in Seoul, South Korea, and um, everything I've ever touched at Kessner Gesellschaft in Hanover, Germany, which is going on right now. So he's got two Hanover shows. Uh, <laughs> collections include the Brooklyn Museum, the Hammer Museum, the Museum of Contemporary Art uh, in Los Angeles, the Metropolitan Museum in New York, and the Whitney Museum of American Art, among like dozens of others. He's represented by Jack Shaneman Gallery, New York, and various small fires in Los Angeles and Seoul, South Korea. Um, please join us for an opening reception in the gallery right next door after the talk, and please join me in welcoming Diedrich Brackens. Hey, how are y'all? Ooh, okay. Um, I never know if people are gonna respond. Um, great. So I wanted to start by just showing these images, which are preparatory sketches that I make through a process of collage and doing a lot of sort of digit, going between digital and hand rendering and then mashing that all together. Um, and this is how I start to start to conceptualize what a work is, what an exhibition is going to be, what the colors are, all of these things. Um, and I think it's just a good way to see sort of like what the work looks like before it's material. Um, so everything I've ever touched, as Jerry was saying, is the name of an exhibition that is currently on view at the Kessner Gesellschaft in Hanover, Germany. Um, and it's my first exhibition of any kind or solo or otherwise in Europe. Um, and I've just been really excited about what the work is doing there, what sort of new conversations are being had around it, um, and having a collection of things that I've made in the last uh, maybe five years or so in, in one space. So um, it's situated on two floors, um, and the second floor is a body of new work that sort of mm, encompasses the title. 
Um, so to make one correction, I should start doing this before the talks, but uh, the motto of my hometown is um, a great place to live no matter how you pronounce it. It's pronounced Mejia. Um, but it's, it's spelled like Mexia, so often people make that, um, that mistake. And I'm, I'm almost old enough to start saying that you, you are not old enough to know this reference, maybe, but Anna Nicole Smith is from my hometown. She is the sort of the famous person that our claim to fame. Um, look her up later. <laughs> um, but one of the things I thought about with this exhibition was it, was it was a chance to both repeat myself, a chance to think about what my work had been, has been up until this point. Um, and because I was showing to a new audience, it was a, a chance to sort of like put a finer point on things that I'd been thinking about in the work and um, open new avenues for myself. Um, so Pacify Me is the longest, maybe the largest work in the show. Um, and something I think a lot about in my work is myth, um, both these sort of classical stories, also these Southern ideas and stories, um, the landscape that I'm from, and sort of my own personal stake, but how that meets up with these historical events um, and trying to take all of these things and mix them together. So often the, the figure is based off of my own silhouette, but I'm using it sort of um, as a, a focal point to think about these historical and mythological ideas. Um, so we maybe all are, are not familiar with the myth of the Minotaur. And what I'm curious about with mythology, I think at this point, is how I can look at these old stories that were meant to be, um, and I think still are, instructive of, of like how to live or the folly of man, all of these, the ways that these stories um, are used to just tell us more about ourselves and our interiority, um, to find something new. So I'm always curious, like, what character do we not speak about or like what characters um, sort of are the foil or the backdrop and how can they be put in the foreground. So Pacifye is the, the mother of the Minotaur, half man, half bull. Um, and she is cursed by the gods because of her husband's like, okay, I'm gonna tell a story, not like the story tells the story, but so her husband gets a bull, right? And then it's like a beautiful bull. He's supposed to sacrifice it to the gods, but he's like, oh, I love this bull. I'm going to keep it. So then the gods are like, oh, what is going on? We're going to curse his wife. Um, wife falls in love with the bull. Then she's like, oh, I really need to sleep with this bull. It's so fine. Uh, <laughs> she gets her inventor that she's got basically imprisoned to make her a fake cow. She climbs inside does the thing, has a baby. It's a bull and a man. Um, so what I'm curious about is, like growing up in Texas, this thing that is so present in the landscape is cattle, cows, the longhorn. Both females and males have these giant horns. I sometimes go down these rabbit holes where I'm like, now I'm on a livestock website finding out like, oh, this, this cow has the longest horns in the world. That's crazy. What does that mean? How do I think about that? Um, but something particular about Texas is this, this place of like mythic proportions. Everything's bigger in Texas. Um, so all of these kind of hyper-masculine, super um, pro-Americana things really like mix in a way there that I think is unlike other places in the country. And it makes it, for better and worse, one of these like very American places, if that makes sense. Um, and so I, I started thinking about that, how that conflates with my identity as a, a black and a queer person, like, and all, how, how, to, like, how do I perform these scripts? What gets placed onto me? What, how do you negotiate all of those things? Um, uh, I'm just gonna let some of these run. Um, but I really started to try to think about biography, mythology, and history, how those things intersect 
to create um, this grander narrative. Um, and it's an idea that I'm borrowing from Audre Lorde, who wrote her, bio, wrote her autobiography in a, um, a mode that she termed biomythography, where you take all these things, combine them to tell that kind of like larger, grand, epic story. Um, and so I use dogs a lot in my work to think about the state, to think about violence, to think about policing, to think about the military. And I'm always sort of curious about how those things um, show up at every point in uh, African American history, American history, and how it is one of the exports that has gone around the world. Um, and I don't necessarily have an interest in showing the violence, but I also don't want to deny the presence of these things. So I'm, I'm always using the dog to implicate those stories. Um, and I think because I'm working in the mode of tapestry in particular, one of the subjects in tapestry that is long lasting from its sort of beginnings is showing the hunt, that you show what creatures are being captured, what things we prize by showing them being hunted, captured, um, consumed in this way. So I, I want to sort of think about how to situate myself in this kind of grand historical medium. Um, early on, when I was just starting to make figurative work, I found myself regularly making images, finishing them, hanging them up, and then either myself or someone else saying like, oh, this sort of seems biblical. Um, and for me, growing up in the South, the church was such a big part of my life and just culture um, that I sometimes feel like, for better or worse, the Bible is like, like inside of me somehow, and it comes up and out. Um, and it's something that I've been trying to be more critical about, trying to crack open again to find that like space for myself. How do I complicate these narratives or unravel them? How can they be remade? Um, so there's a small reference to the burning bush being made here, but also thinking about the place that I live every day in California um, being drought stricken. Not right now, but generally. So like trying to get these stories to move together to think about how I might find new meaning in these older, larger stories. Come on. Um, okay, there's two unicorns. I won't say anything about this one, but this is the, the last work in that set. Um, so I made this, was the first unicorn that I made in 2014. It was the final piece of my MFA thesis and maybe my first sort of uh, tiptoe into working in a more figurative mode. Um, and I, even at the time, I thought of this as a self-portrait and I was trying to um, do a lot of things. Think through textile history. So this is maybe the first moment that I started combining uh, textile techniques that I'd learned in isolation from one another into one fabric. And for one reason, it was that I wanted the textiles to speak multiple languages, that if they were made in techniques that were um, specifically American, European, and African, that they might start to make sense of my own DNA. Um, and in a lot of the abstract works, I had been thinking about how it looked like DNA sequencing or genetic code and so I was, I was trying to think about how textiles, um, whether the viewer knew or not, might get them to start seeing different kind of cultural impulses. Um, there's so much more I want to say about this, but I'm, I'm like, I'm, I get long-winded. Um, and the unicorn was this thing that I decided on specifically because of its place in uh, European tapestries. It's a subject matter, an image that appears over and over again. Um, also, at, in looking at the historical record, when we thought unicorns were these kind of real 
animals. They were often cited in Africa and Asia. Um, so I wanted to try to return it to those textile techniques as opposed to using this European um, weaving or tapestry making tradition. Um, and the other thing that brought me to the unicorn was like, again, these, these conversations I was having with folks who would be like, oh, you know, what do you do? And you're like, I'm a weaver. And they're like, oh, <laughs> I've never met a weaver. And for you to be a black queer person who weaves, et cetera, et cetera, it seems like a unicorn, right? So there was all these conversations about being exceptional that were tied into my chosen profession that I was really interested in and started to make this work to think about, to unpack that a little bit for myself. Um, so between 2014 and 2017, I really started to move back into making figurative work. And I think part of it was due to, to um, like the media that I was consuming and that was being made. It was one of the first times in my lifetime that I could remember um, the media portraying black folks in all sorts of ways, both um, you could be a villain, you could be the hero, you could be um, in a kind of magical realist world, you could be in urban, rural uh, landscape. So there were a lot of creatives telling all kinds of st stories and putting, um, I think making it so that the public understood um, that blackness wasn't this kind of like flat, monolithic um, one-liner. And it made me feel compelled to make more, to make sort of a, a contribution by making more figurative work. And I think in the very beginning, all I wanted to do was make works of black figures just like resting. Like all I wanted them to do was just like chill. So they were like in the water, in tubs, sort of like in repose. Um, and then this is an image from an exhibition called Made in LA, which is a biennial that happens at the Hammer Museum at UCLA um, every two years. And I was in the 2018 version of this. Um, and I think this is maybe one of the first moments where both the work started to get to the things that I wanted to say, and it started to get more of an audience, a critical reception. Um, so I made these four works, and I'm, I'm always curious about making work that responds to the literal moment that it's being shown. Um, so this exhibition would have gone from June to September, and because I knew that Juneteenth would happen during that time, I made the work on the floor, which is called Independence Day 2018. So it was both like indexing that very specific moment, but trying to talk about, again, this place that I'm from, Texas. Um, Juneteenth is the celebration of the liberation of black folks in America. Texas is the last place that um, enslaved folks were freed. Uh, around June 19th, 1865. And so it's something that I've grown up with in my mind and wanting to talk about and celebrate. Um, and it was so specific to the South. Um, and one of the weavings in the exhibition, uh, the one in the center with the fish, the blue one, uh, talks about uh, an event in my hometown that happens on Juneteenth um, in a more mythologized way but this was sort of the subject matter that I was exploring. Um, again, thinking there are dogs and palm trees, thinking about police, thinking about LA. Um, this work is a part of a suite of works that was for my first show at my LA gallery, Various Small Fires in 2019. Um, and I was inspired by, the name of the show was Unholy Ghost. And I was really inspired by a poem by a poet named Essex Hemphill, 
who I have spent, I mean, virtually my whole adult life in conversation with, both in terms of what my work has been about, uh, the imagery, some of the names. Um, he is a black queer poet who died of complications of AIDS in the early 90s, I think 1994. Um, and in his like short life, he just wrote really like prescient, close to the bone, raw work um, that I think still to this day is resonant. Um, where am I? Wrong. Too many clickers. Damn it! Sorry, <laughs> I'm missing images. That's fine. Um, I'll come back to that at another point. Um, and then this is uh, the new museum installation for a show called Darling Divine. Um, it was on the first floor in a gallery that is basically a jewelry box. So anyone who comes into the institution can see um, into this space. And it bought together 10 works that had two figures in them, usually, whether that was two... Um, people or an animal and a person thinking about these, uh, how these relationships function uh, and the kind of this tenderness and the emotional components of like being in relationship with someone or some entity. Um, American Wedding is, again, brings Essex Hemphill in the room. It's the title of a poem that he wrote in the 90s, thinking about um, what it is, what it is to love another man, and I think also in, in a moment where there was no uh, wedding per se, so it really takes this fantastical leap. And these are install shots from an exhibition called Shape of a Fever Believer that opened um, in Oakville, I don't know what the state is, Oakville, Canada, the province, not states, uh, during the pandemic. So I think this would have been 2020. Um, and the exhibition, due to all of the things that we all experienced, was delayed and moved and changed and all of these things during that time. But I started to conceive an exhibition in 2019 um, that was going to be called Blessed Are the Mosquitoes. And something that I had read in 2016 was a quote from the CDC that I'll paraphrase. And essentially it said, um, within their lifetimes, MSM, or men who have sex with men, to use the CDC's language, um, that one in two black men who have sex with men are expected to contract HIV. It was one in four for Latino men, I think one in 13 for white men, and one in six for the general population of men who have sex with men. And I was reading this, I was just really struck by the idea that like 50% of a population that I belong to would sort of be reckoning with this, this like virus um, that we largely think of as managed, as over, as a thing of the past um, in 2016. And the, the study goes on to say, you know, here are some of the ways that this might be mitigated. These are the things that uh, the institution is doing to think about this. Uh, but I just was left like with the sort of like thunder and lightning of like what sounded like an ending to me. Um, so I made, I think there are 10 weavings and maybe 14 figures across the board. Um, and each weaving, half of the figures present have some sort of button or jewel or charm um, on the surface of the body to think about this idea of the virus, to kind of be a stand-in for that. Um, but what the weavings do at large is think about um, how we navigate Ill illness, how we think about he healing and ritual. Um, and something that I really started to think about was that whenever a person is facing any sort of 
terminal sickness or a debilitating illness, we often, even the like non-religious of us, turn to ritual. Like we have some way to organize our lives with our with ourselves and in our interiority, but also in community. Um, so a lot of what goes on in these weavings thinks about um, thinks about that kind of ritual impulse. Um, and I think the, the hardest thing about this work that I should mention is that it was made on the eve of one pandemic, thinking about a, pa a past pandemic. And I, I think I just had a hard time like with this work since all the things that have transpired, both like how to talk about it, how to think about it, because it, it was made not thinking about where we are, but hard for those things not to enter now that we are. Um, so I feel like something that happens as, a, as an artist or like a maker, creative person, like you become things that you don't imagine or intend. And one of those things for me is I've become like the catfish person. Like I, I love catfish. I make a lot of weavings with catfish in them. And I think for, for whatever reason, they, they are compelling to both me, but I think audiences. Um, so I end up talking about and thinking about catfish a lot. Um, and for me, they, all, they are one, a symbol of the South. They are ever present in the landscape. People use them in sport, as sports mascots, as their restaurant mascot. It's on the menu. It's, um, it shows up in a lot of like important cultural ways. Uh, and particularly, because I am going to always bring it back to Texas, in Texas. Um, it's one of the largest, the state is one of the largest consumers of the fish in the world. So there, there are all these things about the fish that like fascinate me. Um, Um, so the, the red and blue images that are showing up are from an exhibition called Pond Keepers from 2020, where I was really thinking about my hometown as this kind of nexus of, um, in the historical lens of racial violence, um, but also thinking about this lake in my hometown where many of these events happened. There's a... Um, Juneteenth, one of the largest Juneteenth celebrations in the country used to be held there. Um, there's land owned by formerly enslaved folks of the region who um, still do events in Juneteenth and these other celebrations there. So it just became something interesting to me to look at, to think about. Um, I mean, catfish for one, but many, many of these other sort of ideas of like belonging and home um, and ancestry and all of these things as well. Um, so in 2021, I had an exhibition at Jack Shaman Gallery called Rhyming Positions. And this is one of the works from that show. And one of the things I set out to do in this, this body of work was to like kind of release myself from having to have this grand unifying theory of an idea that like carried through all the work and could be easily explained and just um, kind of go back to basics of like what images do I want to see? What images have I not seen? Oh, that's out of order. Damn it. Uh, okay, so hold that thought. But this was an exhibition called Ark of Bulrushes that kind of led me to what I was about to go into. Um, but I made this body of works thinking about um, quilts, celestial uh, navigation, and the Underground Railroad. And it premiered at the Scottsdale Museum of Contemporary Art and then traveled on to the Mint Museum in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, and there is a theory that a lot of um, folks in the South in particular are, believe in and are invested in that folks who were enslaved um, used codes embedded in quilt patterns 
to escape bondage and navigate their way to freedom in the North. And so a lot of textile scholars and historians and art historians, all these sort of like high-minded academics have said there's not enough evidence to support that this has happened. Um, but, but if you walk into like an elementary school in the South, even to this day, there, there are people teaching this as curriculum. And I think me, artist, I am like, it doesn't, mm, it doesn't necessarily matter that it happened or didn't. It's a beautiful like jumping off place to think about. And for me, I'm like, why are people invested in the idea? It's because if you are, if you know that there's this group of people that you are related to, descendant from, who largely could not read or write, what does it mean then that they had, um, they were the arbiters of a language embedded in making, that like using your hands um, and this set of skills that you would have had, that you could be um, fluent in some sort of um, communication tool. Like that in and of itself is like an important Liber liberatory like idea and act um, and, and as an artist I'm like even if it happened once like that is more important than like mm, the veracity of like what a, an academic might want to prove um, so I really became like enthralled with these codes and tried to make weavings that like were both in line with whatever the message of the the code was, but also thought about how, how we might think about textiles or craft or any kind of hand making as a mode to sort of like encode or um, self-liberate or self-actualize. Self -actualize. Um, so this star in the background is called the North Star. It's a quilt pattern that essentially would have told its viewer to follow the North Star. Um, Whereas the, the sort of pinwheel shape here is called bear paw, um, which would have meant to either follow the mountain trail or follow in the tracks of a literal bear, uh, which I always am like, it gives me a little like freak out to think about the idea that it, it might have seemed safer to follow a wild animal than like be seen by a person. Um, come on. Um, and this pattern is uh, commonly referred to as Drunkard's Path, which um, just essentially means to move through the landscape in this kind of zigzaggy fashion to, to avoid like a dog finding your trail or these sorts of things. Um, and there's so many things I like about this pattern because it does not feel um, so rectilinear. It doesn't sort of fit the bill of what I think of when I think of quilting. It also reminds me of this kind of like modernist or Brancusi-esque shape and to think about kind of coaxing that out of thread, um, which is often so like bound to the grid is, is like such a feat and a challenge, but also reminds me of the labyrinth to go back to uh, Greek mythology for a second. Um, but I think about, um, God, my brain is off today. Um, there's Theseus is the, the god. Okay, I'm going back to the like non-Greek um, mythology voice. So Theseus goes into the labyrinth to kill the Minotaur. He is given a ball of yarn by, damn it, I can't remember her name. Also, I just remember this is being recorded and I keep cursing. Um, <laughs> but she, woman in question, gives him a ball of yarn. He uses this, goes in the labyrinth, it helps him find his way in and out. And I think that this is kind of a metaphor for what weaving is, that you sort of pass a shuttle in and out of the, the maze of the warp threads. And that back and forth is, is like this larger idea for me around navigation, finding one's way to oneself, the idea that we can um, embed all these different ideas in. Like there, there's this, this, um, this huge piece around navigation and wayfinding for me in weaving. And I think this piece really gets me to thinking about all of that. 
Um, so I, I like to leave a little bit of an Easter egg in any body of work that I do. So um, I've been thinking about mapping and the celestial bodies and quilts and all of these things. And because I was thinking about stars as a means of finding oneself, I made one piece that used um, a Capricorn or goat to think about both my star sign, but also this this great potential um, that we watch the stars and celestial bodies also to think about like how do we navigate closer to ourselves, how do we deal with these interpersonal relationships. But I also I just didn't want to it be like here's a quilt, here's a star sign or a, a celestial constellation, and like keep doing this kind of plop 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 thing. Um, which is what happens here. Um, come on. Um, and so because I was thinking about textiles as this means of self-liberation, I started to ask myself, like, were there ways that, like, uh, a textile object could literally help you move through the landscape? And what textile techniques would these folks have had access to at this time and could I extrapolate those two things into like another possibility um, and so I started making these baskets with this in mind that they could either be vessels for like literally transporting yourself through a waterway or camouflaging yourself in the environment um, and so I made photos that sort of thought about this this performative possibility of these vessels And I, this is my family. <laughs> I love them. They're sweet. And those are my nieces being, mimicking the work. Um, so this is an exhibition called Feedback that was at the Jack Shaman School in upstate New York. There's sort of like a large exhibition space they have to put on uh, like museum quality shows. This was curated by Helen Molesworth. Um, and what I love about this particular install shot is that it was the first time that I thought about myself because my sort of like uh, way of entering spaces often through the South and saying I'm from Texas um, as an LA artist because uh, the boxes are by Lauren Halsey, uh, this is Karan Davis, uh, the painting that you get a sliver of there is Koshin Finley, and then out of frame is a, a small Carrie James Marshall painting. And at some point, and most of these folks currently reside in LA, um, and I just looked at the, like, was in a room where I was like, oh, I'm not, I'm, I'm an LA artist, like, I'm, I live in LA. <laughs> um, as much as the work, you know, dreams and thinks about the South. Um, and so this is maybe one of the largest in scale works to present. Um, the imagery comes from a poem by Essex Hemphill uh, called Rapunzel, where he recasts Rapunzel um, sort of as this black gay man. And I think it was one of the first things that got me thinking about the potential of taking these familiar stories and sort of skewing them or making them strange to, to kind of pull out that, that other possibility for both the story and the, the reader. Um, okay, does anyone remember the crate challenge? Oh, man, I love the crate challenge. It was great. It was good laughs. So for those of you who don't know, during the pandemic, people stacked up milk crates and then like in a pyramid and tried to run up the top of them without them falling to like some disastrous and some like spectacular results. Um, but at the end of the year, there's usually this meme uh, where there's like a, a man or a woman, often a woman in like stilettos walking up like high, uh, stairs and it's like, what I'm leaving behind in 2019 and like what I'm going towards in 2020. Um, and I, I think so much about like what that, what it really means that like we find this moment, this arbitrary moment in time to say like, from this moment forth, I'm gonna be a different person. Um, and like a lot of that is usually about like mm, ascribing to capitalism, having more money, having nicer things, leaving your like 
trashy relationship. Um, and, and I think for me, I was like, at this moment when I made this, where I was like, oh, actually, like, what, what if you like just walked away from, from this idea of that ascension towards this thing or like doing it on these, these terms? Um, and so the weaving sort of responded to a meme, two memes, I guess, in that case. Um, but, but in a, hopefully a serious way. Um, okay, this is when I was saying I wanted to change my life and I forget what I said now already though. Uh, not have this grand unifying theme, blah, 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 blah. And so I just made works where I was, I really wanted to use um, art school a little bit um, and think about color theory. So there were eight works in the show and they were um, speaking to each other across the room. So there were uh, two yellow works and two purple works, two red works and two green works. Um, and I just wanted to make these images that I both hadn't seen before or like invited the, the, the figures or characters to do something um, uh, what's the word I want to use? Um, that they didn't necessarily have to be talking to the audience, that there could be an um, internal uh, sort of thing happening. There's a word I want for that, but I can't think of it. Um, it'll come back to me, I promise. Like I wanted them to have a subjectivity of their own, like that there was something maybe that the viewer did not have access to. That's what I wanted to say. I love tubs. I don't, I don't know what it is, but it's just like, uh, it's such a odd thing perhaps, but it just, for me, triggers like all of the things that I want to have. Rest, like relaxation. Often there's like a touch of, of like something sensual or romantic happening when there's a tub. Even if there's one figure, like I think even being alone in a tub is like, just like, ooh. Um, and I just never get to be in a tub, I feel like, never. Okay, I think I'm, I'm coming to the end. I know people are getting antsy. Um, so the Rhythm of Consent was an exhibition, sorry, the Rhythm of Consent was in an exhibition called Together Their Bellies Form a Single, Single Something, damn. Um, so I really love language and titles, but then it gets me in trouble because I forget my own titles if I don't see them in front of me. Um, together their shadows form a single belly. That's what it was called. Um, long title for a show. Um, but what I did was I was looking at a lot of these symbols and images from um, West African textiles in particular. There's a, a printed textile called Adinkra where uh, stamps are made and then these symbols are printed on the fabric. They have all these meanings attendant to them and um, there's one where uh, two alligators are joined at the belly. So they have one stomach, two mouths, and uh, two tails. Um, and it's something that I've looked at for a long time and thought a lot about. And the, the kind of message embedded in it is that about this interconnectedness or inter interdependence, but also this idea that although uh, there might they might share one belly, they both have mouths. So like you, you still want to like grab the sweet thing because you can't taste it here, like you taste it here. So um, I've been thinking a lot about like what that, what that could mean, um, but also because I work in silhouette, I was really interested in what happens when bodies start to collide or overlap, like what kind of chimera or um, sort of monster or symbol can be made out of those bodies. Uh, 
Um, and then the four works that were in this show, um, just as a way to like pay homage to quilting, this medium that really influences my weaving practice, um, all of the yarn is from previous weavings. So I hand dye all of the yarn for the works and ended up, I end up with a kind of glut of things that there's always just, no matter how well I calculate, there's always still some leftover. So this is where you, not that one, but this is where you get all the kind of striping and things that happen here. I love yellow, I use it a lot, so there's always a lot of excess yellow around the studio. Um, but I, I wanted to try to find these color relationships and like references to plaids and checkered fabrics and um, really in, like turn up the, the fact that the work is woven and it needs to be and by making more references to these kind of textile traditions. Come on, you. Um, and then I'm just gonna just like shh through these last few because this is just like what's going on in the studio right now, some of the work um, being produced, thing, new terrain, things I'm thinking through. This kind of interiority, interior, interiority in these domestic spa spaces, allowing the color to kind of like allow tr uh, narrative to travel through from work to work to work. Tubs. I think, I think that's it. <laughs> okay, I've got a mic. Who's got a question? Ah. Firstly, I'm from Denton, so nice to see a <gasps> oh UNT my God. person. I know, <laughs> crazy. That never happens, that's amazing. I know. Um, there's a lots of tassels and little um, drapery things at the very bottom that seem to be, be quite random. Some have three, some have two, some have none. Why is that? I love that question. I'm glad it's the first one. Um, that's not the one I want. Mm. Okay, that's fine, that's fine. Um, so, question was about the tassels and why, why some, like how do I get to the, the, this, right? Okay. Um, so some of it is just purely based on process. So when I start a weaving, it's all on the loom, and one long strip. And what I typically do is that I weave one strip, I weave the second strip, and then I cut that off the loom. So this, uh, this, and this were connected at one point. Um, and this is just how you tie on to the very front of the loom to start weaving. Um, for me, the weaver answer is because I'm like messing with tradition. Um, and a lot of textile folks, um, a lot of traditional textile folks hate this because I'm basically ignoring how I was taught to be a weaver. You have to think about like this sort of thing. You need to also think about like, there are many other ways that you can address this, right? You could hem it under, you could take those knots out and braid each set of three of those. You could sort of do a macrame, There's, it's annoying and it won't make sense how annoying it is if you have not like been in a room with like 30, <laughs> sorry, I was gonna say something shady. Um, but, uh, and I think, so when I started, there were a lot of people who were interested in weaving purely for process, purely for making utilitarian objects. And I was so already like art school in my brain wanting to make objects about something, right? Um, and I think what got in the way of that was this, like 
being in a room where no one would talk about concepts, but they would like flip your piece over to the back and be like, oh, this is messy back. Like you should have done X, Y, Z things. And we have not talked at all about like what the work is about, right? And so I, I think as a, like I learned how to do all these things the right way, but as a mode of resistance, I was more and more interested in like doing the intentional thing that would like get me in trouble um, as a like way to push back against the traditions and to think about if I'm making textiles as a mode of contemporary art, um, if we think about painting, like we're, we're not having conversations about stretchers or the substrate, right? We're thinking about like why a person is painting and what that is. Like the, mo the mode of, the mode and the process um, have been broken so many times that like that is not up for debate. Whereas I think textiles is still sort of in an infancy, in an infancy when we think about where content and process meet. Does that make sense? Um, that's that's a big part of why. And I think this has just become something that makes my weavings mine. Like this gap is something so so small, but like when seen that people know it's it's my move. Yeah. Somebody put their hand up. No, he did. I did. Did you? Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, first, thank you. This is a wonderful uh, discussion and uh, an, an amazing introduction of your work to our community. And um, I, my question was very similar in terms of the edges, you know, because I, I know a little bit about weaving, but not much. And of course, the warp and the weave, you know, end up resulting in different kinds of conditions. And um, that first part about the fringe at the bottom, but then oftentimes, or not often, but sometimes you would break the edge at the top as well. And, you know, when do you make that decision to kind of break the edge and, you know, create something kind of different? Um, and, and how does that kind of inform your work, I guess? I, I'm just really blown away. I think your work is great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so th that was handy that it was right there. But this is one case of sort of breaking out of the frame. And then there's one that I love. Where are you at? Where are you at? Well, that's a like tiny one. I think sometimes I'm frustrated that something that I wanted is just, just out of the frame. So I, like, I decided to do something to get it back. Like just the tip of that star felt like just this, the right amount of like rupture. Um, oh, come on. Oh, it's right at the front. Um, and I think because the weavings are so wobbly already, like uh, I'm interested in them not being square, not referencing painting, no shade to painters or painting. I just mean, I'm, like, I'm not a painter. So I think I'm always like asking myself, well, why is the work woven? Like, what's important about that? How can I push the kind of uh, textile or sculptural nature of the work um, in these small ways that that keep it exciting for me, uh, that make it important, that it stands up to my own set of questions? Um, yeah. Uh, one follow-up. <laughs> because <laughs> I, I just find your work really interesting. So, you know, mostly you have this kind of tripartite composition, but sometimes you go into like four panels and, and it depends, I guess, on what you're interested in, in terms of composition and scale, but uh, how do you make that decision? Absolutely. Um, thank you for these questions. Uh, so, I work on a loom. I keep saying loom, and I didn't put one picture of the loom in here. Um, that's maybe about three feet wide. Um, so part of the reason that I work in panels is just because of the size of the machine. Yes, I could buy a bigger machine, but then you, the weaver becomes almost like a, it's almost like typewriter, where you would have to like, 
do this, whereas this is like right in the wingspan, so you can kind of like go back and forth a little bit faster. Um, and because of the panels, it makes it fractures things in a way that um, I need a good example. Uh, everything doesn't always line up just right, and I like that moment. And then there are times where I'm like, oh, this is going to be a mess, and everything lines up perfectly. Um, so if I want to make bigger work, I just make I add more panels. Um, in the beginning, the work stayed around about six feet or so because I was interested in keeping things that were almost like a bed sheet or a mirror or a curtain or these kind of domestic interior size things so that when you stood in front of them, that kind of body, uh, tender, tactile thing was more palpable. Hello. Um, thank you for your presentation. It was fantastic. I love your work. Um, I was really curious um, about, uh, it was interesting you mentioned panels. I know that there are like physical constraints, um, but like your love of storytelling and the horizon and how you keep the horizon line very consistent throughout like a lot of your works and how it has that same like steady horizontal beat, like almost like if you combined your works together, they could create a sort of tale. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little, a little bit about that. Thing. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, mm, not these. I think... So there... Okay. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. So in these, um, I started thinking, I guess, more about this idea. Early on, like, the horizon lines always floated about mid-ground. Um, and I think lately I've realized, like, oh, there are certain things that can't happen at that line or, like, what is implied um, when it's right in the middle is something that I like because it almost feels childlike, that it, it just makes sense that you would put a line in the middle and think about what's above and below and what's in the sky and what's on the ground. Um, but I think here I really started to think about, I really want to walk down. I said I wouldn't, um, right? Like that narrative can unfold much slower if it's not all contained in one work, which is logical for any mode of making. Um, and so the, the horizon line starts to kind of travel up and down, both internally and through a series of works. Um, but okay, I didn't show any of this, but I have my like grab bag of stuff that doesn't get in. Um, and so I really started to think about maybe what you were mentioning is like what happens if I let a tale or a story kind of explode into uh, multiple panels. Um, and I think then this leads, I don't know if it's in here. Um, yeah, I think more dynamic things can happen, um, even out of context, like what a viewer has access to or doesn't, um, oh, come on, I feel like I have an image that really starts to speak to what you're talking about, and now I've messed up everything, um, Um, maybe I'm getting out of making that too hard on myself. Maybe that's enough of an answer. <laughs> that I don't know if that answers anything, but it is something that I'm thinking about that the way that line travels. Yeah, I thought this is a really interesting presentation, but I was wondering, uh, like, what your thought process was in picking and choosing colors and how you're working different colors together in the pieces, uh, because I found like the different relationships you had to be really interesting, uh, especially like the, so like some of them have analogous colors, but also some have like, I noticed some little like squares cut out that show compliments and stuff. And I was wondering yeah. what your thought process on that was. Um, thank you. These are great questions. 
Um, so um, if we look at the piece with the crouching figure and the birds flying around, uh, this is the back of that piece. So to be textile weaver nerd for a second, I work in a two processes. One of them is called um, double cloth. And so what happens is the front is a mirror of the back. Does that make sense? So like whatever, there's two layers of fabric, the gray one and then the kind of multicolored, uh, warm colored one. Um, and then the other process is called supplemental warp and weft. So the black figure is basically just held on on the front side of the fabric. Um, and so I, in my mind, even if it's multicolored, I think about one layer as one color and the other layer as another color. Um, and so I, I think immediately I'm just like, oh, I have to form a strong relationship between these two planes. Um, and there's a thread that's harder to see. Um, the threads that hold down this figure are much smaller. And I think in this case, they were, I think they were like turquoise. Um, visually in person, those threads are apparent. And it's almost like uh, I'm mixing down the color. So I'm always thinking about, um, ooh, they're a little easier to see there, I think. So the threads in this one are red. Um, and for me, what that smaller thread does is then I can sort of like uh, turn up or mute the color, one of the other colors in the weaving. Um, and I think that's the place where I start to mix and think about optical mixing. Uh, and often, like, if a color is not right, like, in this case, <laughs> um, in these three, I just wanted to make gold. And, like, I don't work from a recipe, but I wanted the yellows to be golden. And so in the one on the right, um, it was so green. So then I was like, okay, I need to, like, add another color in to, like, kind of turn that green down a little bit. Um, so I think I'm always just responding to what's there and th thinking a little bit about color theory, but then sometimes just like going on impulse. Um, and then seasons. I like if I, when the show is will dictate what colors I use almost without fail. Like if it's summer, I'm going to have like the brightest, warmest colors I can think of. If it's fall, I'll sort of turn down the temperature. Um, and I think because it's textiles, like that makes sense to me that if I'm working in something that we think about, like adorning our homes and our bodies, like to respond to that seasonal color palette makes sense in my way of thinking. Is he? Um, yeah, echoing everyone, thank you for your talk. Um, I was wondering um, for anyone, and anyone else may be wondering this too, just getting involved and in learning how to do textile seems like a kind of a daunting process. Um, and like, I don't have access to a loom. I think a lot of people don't. It's a like big piece of um, machinery. So if you have any tips or like ways to kind of break into weaving textile work for those of us who would want to try it and maybe don't have access to the types of tools um, to do it on like a larger scale. Yeah, 100%. Um, great question. Great questions. Um, so I'm not as familiar with this part of the world, but like if I had moved here and I didn't have a loom, the first thing that I would do um, is go on, I think it's Hand Weavers Guild of America, HGA, um, and they have a listing of all of the sort of like weaving related things by region. So like you could probably go, wow, these small states confuse me. I think we're in New Hampshire. <laughs> I literally, like I will talk to someone on the phone and I'm like, I'm in Connecticut. And they're like, no, it's Rhode Island. Um, <laughs> It's a lovely place. I've been enjoying myself. Um, but you can go filter by state, and it'll show, like, 
there's a hand weavers guild in this city that might be, you know, 10 miles down the road. There could be one here, I don't know. Um, but if you were looking for an actual physical loom, the best in first place is like Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace. Um, uh, I'm like going to meet a man about a loom tomorrow. Um, uh, then I think you start to look at the broader, kind of larger organizations. There's Surface Design, Hand Weaver Skilled, which I mentioned. Um, then if you are like affiliated with any of the larger cities around here, there's other places probably in Boston. There are definitely places in Boston. There's Weaver's classes and workshops in New York City. Um, Aeromont, Penland, Haystack would be the next places I would look at, and they offer summer classes uh, for college credit. So if you want to like learn any number of craft techniques, you can go for like a week or two in the summer, and it's almost like adult summer camp, but where you can learn a blacksmith or fill in the blanks with whatever. Um, but yeah, those would be some of the off the top of my mind things to look into. Um, thank you for your talk. I was wondering, I happen to know, because I actually did a presentation on you um, last term, that you used to sculpt at least a bit. I like heard a talk about, you were talking about a sculpture with a doorknob in it. Um, and I was wondering, I really respect like the history of tapestry. I work um, a lot with textile myself, or at least a bit. Um, that being said, I'm wondering if you have any questions that you feel like cannot be answered through tapestry or that you would struggle to interrogate through tapestry and like what other languages you might use. Man. Um, this is like a, this is also a great question. Um, one that has been coming up more and more recently and I do not have the answer readily available. I think in part, in part, this is, I can't keep, let's see, uh, where are we? Maybe down in here. I think in part, this is why I started in this kind of photo and sculpture series with these baskets, because I, it's not even that I would, felt like I was relying too much on textiles, but I felt like there were other ways that I could articulate an idea or uh, get a viewer to take a a different amount of time with it, or even as the maker, take a different amount of time with it. Um, and it's, I think it's hard for me working in textiles at this point to f f be surprised, if that makes any sense. It, like in the studio, I sort of know all the moves, and I think there's some danger in that as a maker when you get too comfortable. Um, and so even if, I'm always weaving. I think making these other things invites like new, even new possibilities to happen in the weaving, um, to have a break from the weaving. Um, oh, there's a there's something I don't want to lose that I was going to say about this. Um, yes, I I am maybe too aware of the possibility that I can't do anything else, like as a maker. Um, or sure, I could. I could do whatever I want. We all can. But I think I've already like built enough of a idea in people's mind that this is what I. Oh, damn it! Still cursing. <laughs> this is what I do, right? It's catfish and a weaving and a black figure. Um, and so I think for myself, it's I don't want. Like, I want to make sure I'm creating enough runway to do and be other things now and not get to a point where I'm like, oh, well, like, I'll never weave again. And what, how do I, like, where do I go and what, how do I make? Um, so I think there's always ideas percolating in my mind around performance, around uh, film or video works, uh, but still percolating. So how about one more question, and then we go to the exhibition. I don't have that good of a question. Um, <laughs> right to be the last question. I just wanted to ask, uh, what were the names of the places that you mentioned for the summer program? Oh, yeah, 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 the yeah. The three places. I can do this fast, Jerry. Maybe one more. <laughs> um, yeah, Aeromont, which is in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. 
near Dolly Parton Land, or whatever it's called in Pigeon Forge. So that's a good place to go just because of that. Uh, Penland, which is in North Carolina, I think. Haystack, which is in Maine. And then I'll throw in Peters Valley, which is in New Jersey. Thank you. Upstate New Jersey, I don't know. It's, it's foresty, not whatever you might be thinking of. Okay, we're good. Oh, wait, Matt. <laughs> okay, then we'll go. Hi, uh, thanks. Thanks for your talk. Um, it's uh, Dollywood. Uh, Dollywood. I was like, I'm Tennessee. getting the name wrong. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I, uh, you know, I always artists that have um, uh, a kind of uh, a, a deep relationship to craft in their work. I think it's always interesting to uh, get a. Um, get you to tease out a little bit the the relationship between craft and contemporary art um, and where that sort of boundary line is for you. And, um, you know, if there are, um, I, I think it's an interesting subject to think about because there can be a lot of conflict in that and that conflict can be generative um, in terms of actually making art. But I was wondering if you could just sort of um, uh, spell out your own viewpoint on, you know, where craft is, where it sort of ends and art begins and vice versa. <laughs> um, thank you for coming to my talk. No, <laughs> joking. Um, that's a big question for the last one. I should have cut it. <laughs> um, so, yes, I feel like as a as it applies to me and like where I sit in the sort of art craft divide, I am like happily in the center of it. Like I don't feel the allegiance that I would say I feel strongly about is when people ask me, uh, we're going to write out the thing to tell people like what you are, what the talk is that you're going to, or, you know, the bio, I always say I'm a weaver. Like, that's the place that I sit in. Although I know that the work travels in contemporary art context, like to situate the medium and the process is important um, and like generative is important to me to, to kind of stake that claim. Um, and I say that because there are people who make in a craft discipline but would never want to privilege that information, right? Like if we think about, mm, almost went off, off the edge there, but there are artists that I could think about who do not value or publicly value or claim that the techniques that they're working in impart anything to the work, it's just a means to an end. Um, and I think for me, working in a discipline that is largely um, belong to women and folks of color that has a kind of uh, I think what the art world might say, like cultural baggage, like is important to like privilege these, this mode of making and to like, I think as like from my kind of art school professor bag, like I, it's a mode that I want to keep seeing people work in. It's a mode that I think people understand in a different way uh, than we might think about kind of photo or painting or these things. It has this history, it has scholarship uh, that I think connects us back to ourselves in a way that contemporary art is not necessarily out to do or interested in, in the kind of scholarship that it is like accrued. Um, so I think there's just like a, so many other things and people and experiences at the table there that like often the art world or art capital A is not, has not situated itself as like caretaking for. That's my answer. Thank you. <laughs>